welcome to US Free Training Chapter 2. In this chapter we'll be talking about creating editing tree structure and creating edited editing measurement points. So let's move to our UAS3. I certainly hope you have your software open. And uh, in the last chapter we stopped exactly here. So we, will be, we have been looking into the demo data. But now it's time to do some of our own job. So let's move now to data folder that we created at the very beginning that we named your manual. So please click here and click on the tree structure. We have a tree stru two tree structures inside, training and example that we made building 2A. Click on the training and click open. Okay, so this is now our tree structure that we will work on and we will try to build. Of course, it's empty right now. So what we want to do now is first we will think about our assets and uh, what we want to monitor, what will be here inside. Uh, is it going to be one process and that that process will be divided into, into workstations and assets, sub-assets and non-repairable items? Uh, will it be two parallel processes? Will it be certain asset groups that perform similar tasks? Well, that's, that's the decision you need, you need to make and this is part of our training. Not this one, but implementation training that you will learn how to build that, that logic within your organization. In this training we will actually focus on how to practically do it in US 3, how to manage it in US 3. So, use the right click and add new asset. So that asset can now be a pump group, a fan group, it can be process number one, process number two, certain sub-process, whatever you want to, want to do. Just think about hierarchy, think about logic. And that's something you need to do and, and, and you will learn at implementation training. So I will call this a, a recirculation. Why? Right. So now I have a first level, uh, a node called recirculation. But I just made a mistake and I will just repair it. Recirculation of what? So what you will do now is you will click on this, right click and click edit. So I will call it a water recirculation. It makes much more sense. And I will save it. Now don't forget that all these tools you have here as well. Cut, copy, paste, delete, set node alarm, add to work order, survey to each instrument. You can all do it from here as well. But, you know, we are all quite used to working with, with, with the clicks on the mouse, so you will probably find this more, more comfortable way. Of course, you can also use your mouse, arrow left, arrow right, and it will open next node. If I go down, it will just go to the, to the next node on the same level. Okay, so within that water recirculation, let's say we still have some more work to do and we will create a pump group number one. Pump group one. Fine. Now we have our pump group one and within that pump group one we probably have pump number one. Pump one. And I will save it here. Right, you can see now that we are now building this these branches of our tree and they are set in a very logical way. So I have pump number one and that pump has several several assets within and one of them will be certainly a motor and another one will be a pump itself. Of course depending on your configuration uh, excuse me, here you see I made a mistake and that's a good opportunity for you to see because motor is not under the pump so I will delete it here and I'll put it on the right place within the pump 1 so add new asset and it's going to be pump note that I am I'm making a difference between a pump as, an, as, a, as a complete asset so I'm using a capital P and the pump itself 
which is part of that pump asset, pump train, and I'm, I'm using a small pin. So it's done just because it, it, it will make it so easier later to search the database and to understand what is what. So maybe I have a, a whole train, pump number one, and a backup is pump number two. But for instance, if I want just to check a cavitation on a pump volute, I will search for the pump with small p. So it will make things quite easier because we have to see the difference between a pump and a pump. And it's quite important to do it in the beginning instead of uh, repairing your database later. It will become quite painful. So let's say that in a motor we have a measurement point which we will call non-drive end bearing. Nice. Note that I used a measurement point because the non-drive end bearing is actually a measurement point. A motor is not a measurement point. The motor still contains two different, at, at least minimum, two different measurement points. But the non-drive end bearing is a measurement point itself. Uh, very often we use we use a term also a repairable and non-repairable item. So you can use this logic here as well. The, the, the non-drive end bearing is a non-repairable item. We cannot, we, we cannot go deeper than that. So we will be doing a measurements on non-drive end bearing and therefore we will, we will use a measurement, measurement point. And you can see if I click on non-drive end bearing, I cannot add asset, I cannot add measurement point anymore. Now it's time for me to add measurement settings. So this means following hierarchy nicely and going logically from the root of the tree, timber, branches, and then to the leaves. And the leaves are actually measurement settings. So at this point, I hope you understand how easily you can build a tree structure. You just need to follow the logic that you created before. So use the right click and add something there. You can delete, you can cut, copy, paste, do whatever you want. I will show you later what does it mean copy and copy structure only. Now within this non-drive end bearing, I will add some measurement settings. Now this is quite important part, so let's I hope you are doing this together with me on your software and practicing. So here in the creating measurement settings, uh, first you can choose a sensor. So I have certain sensors here defined. And uh, if you remember in previous, in a, in, a, in, a, in a demo data structure, we defined certain sensors. We removed the sensors we don't have in our box. We didn't do it here. So you see what happens. The US3 is offering me absolutely all sensors that are used with 340, simply because I did not limit it before. So let's do it right now. So I will close this. I will close this. I will not do that at this time. I will go to Options, System Settings. Here in the tab Sensors, you will see that all of the sensors are now checked. So let's say I don't have this one. I don't have this one. I have this one. Let's say I don't have a paradish, just to make it uh, just to make it a little bit, little bit more interesting. I will remove ultrasense because probably I don't have it. So those are the sensors I have, and this is what I will be using during my job. Let, let's remove the flex ID as well. Okay, so save and close. And if I move now to set my measurement settings, and I open first. First question is what sensor you want to use here. So let, let's see what's offered. You see, the only thing offered are actually the things I have in my box. So it makes it a little bit easier and I really suggest you to do this because it's faster and more simple. So let's say on the motor non-drive end I intend, intend to use, uh, let's say I have, a, I have a guide, I have a button, so probably I can use RS2T. In some cases, you, you will only be able to use needle on the, on, the, on the grease nipple. But let's say in this case that we have an opportunity, there is a bore through the cover and we can, we can touch the bearing, RS2T. Now, the next question you need, to, you need to define is what will be the sample rate? Because the, the UAS3 will differentiate RS2T sensor or each sensor 
also by the sample rate. So you can use the same lamp, uh, sensor in the same point with different sampling rate and it will be considered as two sensors. So let's say I want to really be to be very precise and I will use focus mode 256 kilosamples per second. Fine, so that's defined. Filter frequency is 36.1 to 40.7 kilohertz. Fine, we don't do it. The category name is automatically generated based on my settings. So it says RS2T focus mode 256K. This is coming from two of my settings. So that's going to be name of this measurement setting. What I need to do is to set interval, but let's say I'm lazy. I just, I just don't have an idea when I will do, do the measurement. I will do it occasionally, sometimes when I, don't, when, I, when, I, when I have free time. And let's make the acquisition time. So acquisition time for a, for a normal operating 1,500 RPM or something like that, three seconds will be more than enough. Just for fun, let's put five seconds. Let's put one minute and half sec and five seconds. You see, I cannot move to two minutes if you see what I'm doing on the screen. I'm, I'm clicking up. Because US3 has automatically calculated what is the maximum acquisition time for this sampling rate. So I can switch to seconds and I can move up to one minute and 15 seconds. Of course, I don't need that much time, but I just wanted to, to show you that it's automatically limited to possible acquisition time. You cannot, you cannot make that mistake. And not making mistake is a good thing and we are trying to stop you in every, in every case. So let's put five seconds. Good, and now I will save my settings because I'm, I'm happy. But as you can see, I cannot save it because the interval is mandatory. That is uh, in, in included recently in US 3 because if you want to do a proper condition monitoring, there must be some rules. And one of the rules is interval when you need to collect that data. You can change your interval as much as you want, but interval needs to be defined. Another reason to do that is because US3 will uh, offer you a reminder uh, for the missed measurements, for the measurements you planned to do, but for some reason you forgot to do. So there must be an interval. Okay, we'll respect that and we will say that we will do it, we will do it every month. So you can choose the interval value and the unit. It can be hours, days, weeks, and months. Let's say I want to do it every month. So I defined RS2T focus 256 every month, duration of the measurement, five seconds. Save. Fine. As you can see now, the measurement is here. The measurement setting is here exactly where it should be. And this small sign here is telling me that there is no measurement inside. So it's empty, it's just a settings. We, we don't have any measurements saved. And that's good because sometimes you will just go through, you don't need to open every point because you know that there's no measurement inside. Now, another good question is why there's no measurement inside. It should be, you should do the job, but we will address that question a little bit later. So what I can do now is set another measurement because I don't want to do only this. I need to do more work. So I will also, I will also uh, measure temperature. And of course, it's very logical to use the same interval because it doesn't make much sense to go every month to measure ultrasound and then every 45 days to measure temperature. It doesn't really make much sense. So, and then we need to set the emissivity. You can set the emissivity any way you want in US3. It's completely open, so you can do it you need to know the emissivity. So let's say in this case it's 093, it's typical in industry, but even if you leave one, uh, it won't be a correct measurement, uh, temperature measurement, because it, it, it ain't going to be a correct temperature, but for the trending purposes it will make sense. Uh, of course if you leave one, the tr your trending will be fine, it will show you increase, decrease or staying the same, but if you want to have a correct temperature, please uh, get informed about what is the emissivity of that particular surface. Put the right emissivity and you will have the right thing there. Okay, now we also want to do uh, some other measurements. We want to measure vibration. And I'm doing it uh, on purpose this way because then you will see that we made a mistake and we will repair that mistake. The reason is because that's a classical mistake you will make 
So that this is a good opportunity to do it. Uh, yes, I want to use my accelerometer. I want to use a sampling rate of 64. I want to have a lot of uh, 64,000 samples per second, a lot. Now I need to define what will be a filter frequency. So you have 5, to, five hertz to 1 kilohertz, 10 hertz to 1 kilohertz, and 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz. Depending on what you are going to measure, and that's not the purpose of this training to teach you how to collect the vibration measurement, just to do the settings. Uh, you will choose one of those or you will make all the settings for all three of them. I will, I will choose this one. And you see the category name is immediately assigned. It's accelerometer 100, row measurement 10 Hz to 1 kHz, 64K. Fine. If we change it, it will be a different measurement. So I can have several of them here inside. Uh, logically, the interval will be the same every month and I will do it three seconds that's just fine but now I have a have a have a question to, to myself because this is going to be probably vertical radially vertical measurement but I also want to add horizontal so that seems that I need to go step back I did something wrong so if I save it here you can see I have it here everything is fine but the problem is now that if I want to make it one, one vertical, one horizontal, and one axial, I cannot do it in one point. Because the point will not let me to have the same, the same settings for the same sensor multiple times. So it's not fine. And now I want to remind you what, what, what we said in the beginning. Don't make uh, 1000 measurement points and then go and work and realize you made a mistake in the beginning. So it's better that you make all your, all your mistakes in the beginning, fix them, and then continue. After that, you'll be doing a lot of copy-paste. It's going to be quite easy work if you do the job right the first time. So what we realize here is that we have a non-drive end bearing, but we need to consider vertical, horizontal, and axial as three different positions. So let's do this. Non-drive end. First, I'm sorry. First, let's uh, let's add uh, uh, more vibration settings. So we did uh, 10 hertz to 1 kilohertz. So let's do the same thing with 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz. Let's say we need that kind of measurement. So this is the way you will set it. You will leave three seconds, and you will say save. So everything is here. So right now, the settings we define, we want to define for this point is here. The only trick is that we need to do it three times, vertical, horizontal, and, and axial, considering that we are doing vibration as well. So let's repair this small mistake from the beginning, and let's edit this point and say non-drive end bearing vertical, save. Uh, of course, now we need horizontal and we need axial, but now we already did some job, so why not doing some copy paste? So I will use copy structure only in this case. Copy structure only means that it will copy the hierarchy, it will not copy the data. When you click copy, it will copy the hierarchy with all included data. In this particular case, when it's completely empty, it doesn't really, it doesn't really make any difference. But in future, when you want to copy certain hierarchy, for instance, you have the pump and now you have the same new pump, you want to copy the hierarchy, uh, click copy structure only to avoid copying data, but just to help yourself and copy the hierarchy. So let's copy structure only, move one level up to the motor and paste it two times. Okay, now we have non-drive and bearing vertical in brackets one and two. So we will edit it now and we will say that this one is not vertical, it's actually horizontal. And this one is not vertical too, but it's actually axial. Good. Now let's see let's see what we have now here inside. Like we can open them all and see that we have ultrasound in all three of them. We have temperature in all three of them, but we don't need that actually. So if we measure, if we check before where is the perfect position to measure ultrasound, so where, where we have the highest possible, highest possible signal, 
let's say we have it in horizontal position and we will remove this measurement setting so we will remove it from vertical and we will leave the temperature because at that point or, or on, a, on a grease fitting it's a good point to measure temperature uh, I will leave ultrasound in horizontal but I will remove the temperature because I don't need to measure it on three points and on axial I will of course remove ultrasound and I will remove temperature fine now we have the configuration exactly as it should be so we have pump group one pump one on the motor non drive end side you can call it any way you want outboard number one or whatever bearing i i usually use non drive end and we have a vertical measurement where we will take a measurement on the on the grease nipple for the temperature and we will take the measurement of uh, uh, vibration Horizontally, we will take vibration and ultrasound because ultrasound we need only in one direction. And then we will go down to axial where we don't need ultrasound, we took it already. We don't need temperature, we took it already. So let's just do the vibration. So here is the whole configuration for non drive end, for the non drive end bearing. But it still doesn't work really nice if, if you want to be really 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 precise and uh, something that uh, that they call me very often a nerd so now in the motor we have non-drive head bearing vertical non-drive head bearing horizontal non-drive head bearing axial the logic tells you that the next thing we will be we will build will be drive and vertical horizontal and axial so just to give you an option some people like to have it divided so they say motor non-drive end and within non-drive end they will put non-drive end vertical non-drive end horizontal non-drive end axial if you want to do it that way do it that way that's fine it will not bring much of the added value it will just give you one more node and it might complicate things a little but if you want if you want to do it it's absolutely okay no problem about it uh, let's now understand that probably on a drive end we will be uh, taking the same measurements as on non-drive end. So we will copy this one, say copy structure, go one step up and we will paste it one or you can use control V two times, three times. And what I will do here is first edit, I will remove this and I will remove non-drive end and it will be drive end, save. So I have my drive end bearing. I will, I will do the same thing with other two measurements. So this is gonna be horizontal. I hope you are stopping me right now and saying you made a mistake. Yes, we did make a mistake. And those mistakes are here for the tutorial so you will not make them. What we did is that we copied non-drive end bearing vertical into the three different three additional points while we should be copying non-drive end bearing vertical, horizontal and axial separately. The reason for that is because they contain different measurements. What we did right now is that in drive end, what we want to be drive end, we copied everything from non-drive end vertical and that's a mistake and that's a nice one that you will not do in the future so you will delete this you will delete this and you will leave drive end bearing vertical fine because we copied drive end bearing vertical here now copy non-drive end bearing horizontal copy structure only go up to the motor and paste it and now change the name so it's going to be drive and bearing horizontal save and then axial same thing copy structure only go one step up paste it in and then just edit to drive and axial Okay, so as you can see, we made a complete setting on a motor. 
This is one style, as I told you, you can do it differently if you have enough nodes. If you don't have so many branches before, so you can divide motor into drive end and non-drive end. And then within drive end and within non-drive end, you can, you can create vertical axial horizontal. Of course, if you are not using vibration, it will simplify things a lot in the setting because you don't need vertical, horizontal and axial because you will be doing ultrasound only in one direction. So you need only one point. We did it here simply to show you uh, when you want to make all the settings, what is, what are the things you need to pay attention to. So we did all that, fine. Uh, now let's, let's just think, think about it for the moment. How much information do we have here? We have information that we have non-drive end bearing and vertical. Fine, that's okay. But can we add a little bit more information? Because uh, it will not change much in our work, but it will change a lot uh, once we start organizing our work. So uh, let's ask ourselves a question. Is this bearing uh, sealed or it's being greased? It's being lubricated. Is it lubricated with oil or grease? So if it needs to be lubricated, why not just putting a small L here? So it is lubricated. It's not a seal bearing. So somebody needs to take care about it. And if it's lubricated with grease, why not just putting LG? So saying, yes, it's lubricated and yes, it's lubricated with grease. So I'm doing this because later on I can really easily filter out all my bearings which are lubricated with grease as opposed to all my bearings which are sealed. So I can say, show me all the motors which do not have sealed bearings. They are lubricated with grease. And I can extract them out and take a look. There can be a million reasons for that. But one of the reasons can be, yes, we are doing great condition monitoring, but it seems that we have a lot of problems on grease lubricated bearings. So let's talk to the, to the, to the loop team. That's, what, that's one of the options. So having it uh, easily, easily filtered, it's quite interesting and quite, quite good thing. So why not doing that? So we can, we can put LG to all of them as an additional, additional information uh, because they are all lubricated with grease. So just give me a second and I hope you are doing the same thing in your software right now because that's the only, the only good and successful way to, to learn something by doing it. So let's move also here, LG, and the last one is going to be LG. Fine. Okay, now we took care of the motor. We have everything there, everything is fine. Now we have additional option if you really want to play, if you are a visual guy who wants to see that. So we can, we can go uh, just check utilities, system images. What do we have here? So we have some, some images, fine, that's, that's okay. But we can upload some new images. And that's, that's, that's always useful. So let's see, let's see where we can find something interesting. Okay, pictures for icons. Okay, well, this is a nice one, the motor. Cool, now it's here. Let's upload more. Uh, nice picture of the bearing. Uh, you can upload anything you want, just be careful. It's a small, it's a small uh, picture. Fine, we can put a pump there also. It will be useful. And a small icon of pump. Nice. Good, now we can set it here. So now let's go to pump number one and edit this point a little bit to make it a little bit more beautiful. So I will add icon and this is going to be my, my pump, the whole train. Good. Now it has an icon. Now my motor can also have a nice icon. He deserves that. Okay, select, save, it's here. And of course, non-drive end bearing. It's a bearing, so you can choose a nice icon if you want. I'm just showing you the opportunities. You don't have to do it. Uh, do it as you like. 
some people are more visual and sometimes when you are showing when you are showing to other people what you are doing I notice that it's they like to see those icons because then they can visualize what you actually do especially when you are talking with when we are trying to represent your results to people who are not really involved in condition monitoring but are making some decisions so this can be quite helpful because people visualize much easier what you are doing okay okay now we have it all but of course uh, now we have a motor itself why don't we add some navigation picture to that motor it can also be quite useful now let me find something uh, you should find something in your computer what you actually have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well it seems i don't have much here let's see where do we have something okay machines right okay let's put let's put this motor as a picture right now i edited this point the motor itself with additional navigation picture where is it now if you click here and you select yes show me navigation picture pen that's your motor so your motor is now here and that motor has a lot of different positions you can see this these points here that you can now put on the right place so this one is drive and bearing vertical good that's one is, that that one is going to be here non drive and bearing vertical so that's one that one is going to be here let's see further so this is non drive and bearing axial probably here this is drive and bearing axial let's put it here so this is drive and bearing horizontal let's put it here and therefore you will find all the others and put them on the right places so what you what you have here if you click motor and then you click drive and bearing it will lead you directly to this point so you can use this navigation and actually navigate through, through the machines and its measurements exact, exactly the way you want here it will take you directly to temperature directly to to, to vibration and other, other vibration measurement so navigation picture and if I go to parent here navigation picture serves the purpose to help you to locate the measurement points much more easier so if you like do, using it this way here it's how it how it is used now we have we have uh, 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 another question that we need to address and it doesn't doesn't have really anything to do with with functionalities of US free but do we really need the axial measurement on both both uh, drive and bearing or non drive and bearing uh, many of the colleagues told me many times actually not so you can remove it if it doesn't it doesn't need to be done or you can just leave it here so it's not it's not a matter of functionality of US free so now we have a motor and we have a possibility here to expand all when we click expand all from the motor it will expand the entire branch down to the leaves meaning it will open all the nodes down to the measurement level so you can see them all here fine we did a lot of effort here and we did a lot of work here so I'm just wondering why don't I first collapse it all my pump also has two bearings so why don't I just be the lazy guy and delete the pump copy the motor this time structure only remember if you have data it will copy also data if you if you use copy so I'll copy structure only go one level up to the pump and I will paste it so yes I have the motor but it's not actually the motor it's the pump we are just being lazy and helping ourselves the node icon no 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 no. it's not that one I will choose this one but I will also remove this one so now I have a proper icon uh, navigation picture we can we can remove it here and we can see do I have any pump nice pump picture here 
Uh, well, let's use this one. This is a dire pump, but okay. So you can see I have everything here now. Now I have non-driving, bearing, driving, bearing. Everything is here what I need to do. Uh, because I, I, I prepared all the settings. So what I can do now is, first of all, we can, we can uh, be in a situation that pump is lubricated with oil. So <coughs> we will make a first edit and we will say LO because it's not lubricated with grease, it's lubricated with oil. So this is the first thing we need to do and please do it in your, in your software as well. This is time to practice and try, time to learn. Lubricated with oil, edit, lubricated, sorry, with oil, same here, and same here. Good. Now we basically set up the pump as well, not driving, bearing, drive and bearing. But there is also a different logic that we are going from non-driving bearing on the motor to driving bearing on the, on the, of the motor, but then we are going to drive and bearing on the pump. So why not just changing the order? You change the order and you can move it up and down by drag and drop. So you can see I click it here, select it, hold my mouse, go up to this point and it will be removed. So I have drive and drive and drive and, and all three non drive and. Of course, this is in case I'm using both ultrasound and vibration, so I want to have all three directions measured. Of course, don't forget that uh, ultrasound is only in one of them because you don't need all you don't need all three. But pump is very interesting because on a pump we have additional thing and that's volute, the body of the pump, the place where we measure the where we measure the cavitation. So I will add one more point here, another measurement point, and that measurement point I will call volute of the pump. Save. And inside that volute of the pump, I will make a new measurement setting, and that measurement setting will use RS2T. Let's do it in high resolution as well, in the focus mode. And I will use the same interval because it's the only logical way to, 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 to use the same interval. But considering that I want to hear what's going on with that pump from, from the perspective of, of cavitation, which is a, a random event, it's a natural event, so I will lift it up to 10 seconds. Maybe, maybe too much, but it wouldn't hurt. 10 seconds, wasting 10 seconds is not, it's not a big deal, but it will help a lot. And I will save it. So now I also have the volume and more or less I have everything. I just set nicely my pump one with a motor and a pump. All my measurements are inside. So again, as a lazy guy, if you want to, if you want to do the job easily, hire a lazy guy because he will always find a way to do it in a simple, simple mode. So I will copy structure only of pump one. I will go one level up to pump two, uh, to, to pump group and I will paste it. And that's going to be my pump tool. With all, with all its elements inside, as you see, motor and a pump, everything is fine. But I will add one more explanation, simply because that might be the case. I will say that pump two is actually backup. So it's, it will help me later when I want to filter the data out. If I want to say, okay, it's a third Saturday in a month, now we are starting the backup pumps for a few hours to work, so now it's a good day, please filter out all the backup pumps, put them in one work order and go out there and do the job. So putting these nice names will really help you a lot. So we created pump group number one with two pumps, pump one and, and pump two backup. But we probably have several groups with several pumps and backups with, within them. So let's copy structure only, go one level up and paste it. And now I have pump group uh, one copy. Of course, I will edit this 
and I will call it pump group 2. Nice, now I have pump 1, pump 2 backup. Probably I will call this pump 3. And it's gonna be here pump 4 backup. Nice. Of course the names you are putting here, just for the purpose of practicing, I'm putting pump 1, pump 2, 3, 4. These are gonna be names you use you use in your in your organization. So those names need to be clear to everyone. Pump group number one or two can be east and west, north and south, a uh, 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 close one, far one, uh, blue one, green one, green one, whatever you want to name it. But those names needs to be something that everyone understands, especially the person who's gonna collect the data, because the same uh, name of the asset will be displayed in his software in his uh, firmware on the instrument, excuse me. So that means he needs to clearly understand that. And there, if there is a name of the pump, which called uh, PW71, uh, then put PW71. That's the name it should be. Now for the training purposes, we are just, just putting one, two, three, four, or whatever else. But these additional things, uh, backup or, or this, it's good to be in the name, because then it will help you filter data, as I, as, as I told you. But actually, I have three groups. So let's put group number three as well. So that's going to be pump group number three. Save it. Open it up. And this is going to be pump number five. And pump number six backup. Okay. Pump number six backup. Now we have a certain amount of, of assets. We did some nice job, you did some excellent job. And we made some uh, good mistakes. Mistakes are good because we, don't, we will not copy paste a zillion times and then realize we made a problem. So make all your mistakes in first several assets, please. And from this point on, after two or three assets, or, or six in this case, don't go too far. Now let's do some work and then see if we actually did it really good. If it's not good, there will be still very fast and very easy, easy adjustments and then we can move on. So for the moment, let's put this in, uh, let's create a work order. This is another chapter which we will discuss now. So I have many ways to put something in a work order. First, some facts that you need to know, you can see on the screen, and this is from the manual, so sometimes you really need to read the manual, sorry. Uh, work order or survey is an organized task. Uh, it's extracted out of the tree structure. So what you need to remember is this, that one item can be in several work orders or surveys. So you can take one item and put it in a work order with name Monday, with name of the operator, uh, with name of the of the monthly or whatever you want, you can put it in different different uh, uh, work orders. So work orders they do not affect tree structures at all. So the tree structure is how you set your assets when you want to look at them, analyze the data, understand what's going on. This is what you are doing as a as as a person who a condition monitoring engineer in front of the computer. But when you are in the field it may not necessarily uh, be the, the, most, the most efficient order. So you can change it, you can do whatever you want, it will not affect the tree structure. So the work order survey is actually a list of selected items, tasks, put in one list where you will, you will go out and do it. So you can play with it as much as you want. Now you will probably remember what I said at the beginning, do not necessarily build your tree structure in a way you will go out and collect data. Do it in a way, the most appropriate way to look at the data. And about collecting the data, we will do it in a work order survey. We will adjust that and optimize this, this work order to be the best possible way for a technician to go out and collect data. The most logical way, safe way or whatever you want. So you can create as many work orders as you want. There are really no limitations. You can do whatever you want. Uh, sometimes uh, people just delete work orders and create new ones. 
If you ask me, not necessarily, because most of the things will be repeating. So something you do on the first Monday in a month will happen next month as well. So there, probably there's no need to delete them, but nothing stops you to do that. And you can rebuild it again. Uh, work orders can contain items from one tree structure only. So what I have in this tree structure, I can put in this work order. I cannot have uh, 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 two machines in two different tree structures and then put them in one work order. It doesn't work that way. What happens between in the relationship between uh, software and instrument is a master-slave relationship. So the master, the software, puts the database, this, this particular tree structure, with all the information within, alarms, uh, work orders, settings, everything, put in the instrument, and then instrument actually works based on that tree structure. You cannot put two tree structures. So when you are setting it, you need to put, you need to put uh, 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 the logical set of assets in one tree structure. But you can, you can create as many work orders as you want, you can combine them any way you want, uh, you can put them in different order, and this is, this is what we will do right now. So let's put it this way. So I will create a work order which needs to be logical for me or my technician to go out and do the job. From the point of the person who is looking at the screen, uh, this is quite okay because I see pump group 1, pump group 2, pump group 3. I see pump and a backup pump. So if I'm thinking about a condition of my pump 1 and I see certain problem and I want to plan some activity to change bearings, to align the pump, to balance the, the, the impeller, whatever, it's quite useful to have at the same point pump 2 backup. And then I will check the condition of pump 2, which is backup, and I will say to myself, okay, pump 2 is in a good condition, so I can easily plan repair of pump 1. So it's quite interesting to have them at, at one point together, but it's not really logical when you go out in the field, because they never work together. So setting the work order where, where pump 1 and pump 2, which is backup, are together doesn't make much sense, because you immediately know that the job will not be done. So it will just unnecessarily uh, confuse the technician, it will confuse you, it will confuse anyone. There might be someone uh, saying, yeah, I must do it, let's, let's start the pump, let's, let's change everything. Unnecessary complication. Follow your logic. The US free is here to give you the opportunity to do the job the way you want it to be done. So let's, let's do it this way. What we, uh, let, let's say that pump one, uh, pump, groups one, two and three are in the same building. So they are quite close. So it's very logical to do it all at one shot. So go out there, take the measurement and come back. Fine. But at that moment, the backups will not be working. So let's do it separately. So let's do, let's do this. I will select pump one, right click, add to work order survey for the instrument 340. I can only add it to new because I still don't have any, any work orders in my, in my uh, selection. I will click it here and I will call it, let's say, pumps inspection and save it. The list is here, the work order is here. So you can see pump inspection contains I'll just open it this up a little bit so you can nicely see it. Sorry. Okay. So it contains the root of the database, training, water recirculation, pump group one, pump one, motor, non-drive and bearing vertical, lubricated with grease, temperature, acceleration 10 to 1, acceleration 10 to 10, da 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 da, -da. everything is here. Everything from pump one. Good, so that's pump one. But we know that in the same time we will be collecting data from pump three as well. So let's select pump three, add to work order survey, and now it's offering you, you wanted to add it to new one or you wanted to add it to existing one. Of course, to existing one. Because I will have all my active pumps there. I will do the same thing with pump, pump five. Right click and add to pumps inspection. Good. 
So let's see what we have here now. My pump inspection is now a serious work. It's a nice, cool, serious work. So everything is here. Excellent. Now, what about backups? Now I can create a new work order, which will contain only backups. And I will call it new work order survey. I will call it backups only. And I will save it. Now my pump two is backup is here already. I will add others to backups and I will add also this one to backups. So now you can see I have my regular pump inspection. I have backups only as a separate job because that will be done in some other time the way we plan it. So this is how I add something to work order. But I can also do it in some different ways. So I can click here on my water recirculation. And I will go to bottom pen. Open it up a little bit so I can see better. I will click on selection. And I will click on filter. Okay. Now, the way to select something out works in, 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 in this way. Let's say I want to check only grease lubricated bearings. I put LG. So as you can see, only LG is here now. So it's filtered out. Okay. Considering that, that backups are not working constantly, so I can play that game a little bit more and I can say yes, but I also want it to contain word backup. Nice. Now we have two filter criteria. So now what is, what is uh, selected now, what is extracted now is all the backup pumps with grease lubricated points. Which is excellent. I don't, I, I, not, not, now I can do it as a separate work. So nothing stops me to select them all. Go down, press shift. Now they're all selected. And now tell me, what do you want to do with them? Well, I want to create another work order. And that's going to be a new one. So I click on the work orders in the bottom, bottom toolbar. And I said add to new. And what, what, what we will call it? We will call it uh, Grease Lubricated Backups. Why not? Because the, they don't work very often. Uh, we cooperate nicely with lubrication teams. So we want to check them extra because there might be some problem if it's really cold and the grease is very dense. There could be many reasons for that. But what I want to show you here is how to extract certain points out. And we can say, okay, put it there. Right, now I will remove my filter. And let's hypothetically put another situation here. I have a technician, a process technician, who is sometimes checking welds and all the other stuff. And I can easily ask him, can you please just check the, the body of the pump, the volume for cavitation? while you are playing with, 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 with the valves. Why not? Probably he will say, nah, don't push me into the bearing. That's not my job. But of course, easily, I can put the sensor and listen to cavitation and collect data. That's a great, great job because I will be playing with valves anyway. So why not? I can put here the keyword volume. So you can see I have one, two, three, four, five, six. I have six volutes on my six pumps. And that's great, but I want to send him to pumps that are actually working right now. So I will use control button and I will skip the backups. So I will take only these three pumps and I will add it to new work order, which will call, which will be called, let's say cavitation check. Good. I'm doing more work orders simply to show you what, what, what else you can do. But if you click here, you see I have a lot of work orders. So what you are creating here is an excellent menu. It doesn't touch your tree structure at all. It doesn't, it doesn't affect your work as a condition monitoring behind the screen at all. So if you go here, everything is still the same. It's perfect. Now how the data will be collected, how you will optimize that work, who's going to do that? 
Sometimes it's going to be a grease guy. Very often it's going to be a condition monitoring technician. Sometimes it can be actually an operator, somebody, somebody from the process. So if the operator is there to play with valves, why not checking for cavitation? If the grease guy is there and doing his regular grease job, why not? He can do this. So this is created in a, in a, with, with, with optimization in mind. So you, can, you, can, you have a full freedom to do, to do whatever you want. And that's the whole point, without touching your tree structure. So if you go back, your tree structure is here, nothing is changed, everything is nice and perfect. So we will kill the, uh, the, the, the filter now. We don't need it anymore. Selection, everything is here. So our next move to do is just to go through this and see if we did the job right. So yes, we have pump one motor, non-drive and bearing vertical horizontal axial because we are taking also vibration. Then we got the drive and bearing, nice, we have everything we need. So there is a volume position also on the pump, the same thing with the backup, excellent. Excellent, it's good. Now let's go to the work orders. And let's take the simple one, the shortest one, just to be able to show you. And we say that he will be checking a, a, a cavitation, for instance, on the volute. So this is my position. Pump one, pump two, pump three. This is the order how it will be shown. But we can say, no, let's put the pump three first. Let's put the pump three first. Let's put it in reverse order. So now we have three, two, one. So nothing stops you to change the order if you remember what I told you in the beginning. Don't bother with, with the tree structure. You can change everything in the work order to optimize the work for your, for your condition monitor te technician to make it simple, nice and safe for him. You can do the same thing in all of them here. Just change the order. So nothing stops you to do that. As a matter of fact, you can Let's, let's delete one that we can easily find later. So the last one, you can actually delete that one. So I deleted one point for whatever reason. So uh, what I'm trying to show you here that you can change orders. You can delete certain points from the, from the work order and you can add a lot of other points to work order. Now, what you need to pay attention to that is that one point cannot be in the same work order twice because it's simply not logical, but it can be in multiple work orders. And when adding something to work orders, you can add an entire branch node. You can actually add a certain leaf, as we call it leaf, the measurement point. You can add also this. So, you can choose whatever you want. It's absolutely flexible. There are no, I will not say there are not rules, but there are no, no restrictions or limitations for you to build exact work order that reflects the reality uh, in, your, in your organization and, and in your work. So what we will do next is this. Let me show you. So you see my instrument now. Okay, so I turned on my instrument, I connected my instrument with USB cable to my computer. I go back here and I say, okay, device 340, upload from PC to 340. Uh, because later you'll be downloading from 340 to PC. So upload from, from PC to 340, it's telling you now SDT device is ready. If it's not ready, refresh it. If it's still not there, change the USB port and make sure your instrument is on and connected to your computer. Okay, now we will transfer the data. Before transferring the data, US3 will warn you that transfer of the new data will delete everything old, what is already in the instrument. So just to, just to expand on this a little bit, when you come back from your, from your, from your work order, from your task, from the field connect, collecting the data, and you download all that data from the instrument into the software, it's still in the instrument, it's not deleted. Just in case, there's no reason to delete something, memory is cheap. 
So we are not deleting it because whatever happens, at least you have your, 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 your last set of data in your instrument. So it will be deleted when you upload the new set of data to instrument, it will delete the old one. So US3 will just warn you to make sure that you deleted, for instance, yesterday's task because now you're uploading new task. So I will say, yeah, okay, I did, I did it properly. So it will, it will check the device and it's now transferring all the data that we have. We still didn't build any, any alarms. We will do it in the, next, in the next chapter. We will play with that a little bit. So, as you can see now, uh, upload was, com was completed successfully. Zero alarms, zero events, one operator, four different surveys, four work orders, 198 measurement nodes and zero measurements because we, we don't have any. Okay, that's it. So, uh, uh, now when we transfer the data, it's time for us to go to work. So, what do we have in our instrument now? We have the tree structure with all the settings down to the leaf level, what needs to be done, what is, what, is, what is acquisition time, what is emissivity, what is the sampling rate, everything you set in your software is now in the instrument. All the alarms are in the instrument. We didn't build any yet, but we will, surely, but that's transferred also. All the work orders are transferred as well. So everything is there. Now, practically this little job we just did is now in the instrument as well. The good thing is that instrument will every time take another job that you give him without, without any changes. So I will, I, will, I will explain how to build alarms because that's going to be our next, uh, our next job to do. So what we did until now is that we built this free bump groups. We created some nice work orders we created them on a different criteria we learned how to filter the data we learned how to move the data up and down to adjust our our work order to be fully optimized for the technician in the field uh, we realized that it doesn't touch our tree structure at all so we we added some nice icons we added all that needs to be done every measurement has a, has a settings as you can see settings are here you can edit settings just by clicking right uh, right button button on your mouse and saying edit you can change it here but don't forget to transfer it again to your instrument because then changes will be uh, effective so we prepared a complete job and we can go out in the field and actually do it but let's also put some alarms let's learn how to how to work with alarms a little bit so when we speak about alarms, we can speak about primarily two kinds of alarms. The first is a template alarm. You can find them here. Utilities, alarm functions. So alarm list is like your alarm bank. So you create certain alarms with, with uh, on, at the, uh, monitoring certain, certain sensor and a certain uh, indicator at a certain value and put it here in the bank. So it's, it's like your template. Then you can attach that alarm to any points or multiple points that you want in your tree structure. But you can also use a node alarm. This is an alarm that you set up directly in the node and it doesn't affect any other node. Uh, the reason to, to do that is you will learn, learn quite soon is that when you want to add something to multiple points, alarm, let's, let's imagine you have a conveyor with uh, 80 bearings and they are more or less all of them are somewhere in the same area with with what we consider normal so you will try to put, put to put alarms on all of them equal alarm fine then you will you will you will basically create an alarm called conveyor bearings and attach them to all of the bearings on that conveyor if that's reality of the condition in the field but one day you have one bearing behaving strangely and you want to change the alarm if you change that template the change will affect all of the bearings where it's attached and maybe you don't want that so for that purpose and for purpose of customizing for each point you will be using node alarms so let's start with alarm list let's create a, an alarm that will be able to attach later to all of the points so 
here you need to first click new you will create new alarm when you create new alarm the first question is what sensor is it attached on so what se what sensor is considered so i will say in my case let's put it rs T. okay but which one be more specific yes 256 so RS2T focus mode 256 kilo samples per second because there can be some other settings where where sampling rate is lower 32 kilo samples per second but we mostly put everything 256 so let's stay with 256 uh, what will be the alarm name well for the purpose of understanding easily let's differentiate it quite easily I will say cavitation alarm now I will be I will be uh, inventing some numbers here, of course, because we still don't have any data to base that alarms on. So I'll just improvise because the purpose of the, of this tutorial is to show you how to do it. So the next question is: uh, Just imagine that you are, you are you are communicating with this alarm, and he's asking you, okay, what do you want me to monitor? I can say, well. You can monitor RMS, you can monitor Max RMS peak and crest factor for the RS2T, for the, for the ultrasound sensor. So I will call this alarm uh, cavitation peak. I'm giving it this name so I can easily find it later. And I want him to monitor my peak value. And I'll say, yeah, I want absolute mode on and based on my my already collected previous data please be so kind and uh, when the peak is more than 50 show alert when it's more than 56 show me warning when it's more than 62 call it a danger okay so now we have the absolute mode on and now the the, the alarm will be monitoring on that sensor with that sampling rate on that indicator will be monitoring this value but I can also put the safe mode. So I can say, yeah, safe mode on. So the lower limit, if the peak is 10, then I want to be alerted because that measurement is not correct, absolutely. So A, the sensor unit is on a completely wrong position. B, machine is not working at all. So it's a good thing because then you can filter the bad, bad data out. And of course, if my peak is over uh, 100, Sorry, if it, my, my peak is over 100, also please warn me, warn me about that. And then we can say a relative mode. The relative mode, if you click the relative mode, you can uh, uh, monitor if the value is increasing or decreasing in respect to A, previous value, first value, or reference value that you set. So let me just expand it a little bit on this. So relative mode increasing, warning when increase that much and danger when increase that much. The same thing with decreasing. Please give me warning or danger if it decreasing at, at a certain level in comparison with the previous value or first value or reference value. Now, if we, if we use the previous value, I will, I, will, I will ask you to be very cautious because if you say, uh, if it's increasing uh, 6, then give me the relative alarm. Give me the, the alarm that, that something is actually changing. It's still within the absolute values, but it's changing. It, it, uh, it can be problematic if you are not completely aware of the structure of your data and the intervals. Because it can be increasing if you are measuring it very, very, very densely. So let's say... <laughs> just to go to the extreme every single day and every day it increases by one so after six days it will be increased by six but this alarm will not trigger because it's 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 comparing with a, with a previous value and previous value was just one db db microvolt down so just be just be careful about that and uh, and and pay attention you can do it based on the first value so you can say to your to your to your alarm, please uh, uh, compare this new measurement relative to the first value we ever measured, or to the reference value, which is also a very very intelligent thing to do because first value is not necessarily a good one. So the the, the for two reasons you are not starting your condition monitoring uh, in a brand new organization. 
And normally it doesn't work that way. The second issue is that the fact that the machine is brand new and, and, and installed right now does not necessarily mean it's good. So you don't want uh, just by default to say the first, the first measurement is the best measurement. It's not necessarily, necessarily the truth. So you, you can also choose the reference value and here you will select which one. Uh, still we don't have any, so we cannot use this. But I just wanted to show you how you will how you will do that. So you will choose one of those, and saying, okay, uh, if it goes up by three, give me warning. If it goes up by six, give me danger. Uh, decreasing is normally used on crest factor, because when crest factor decreases in a, in a progressing defect, it's a quite a bad sign. That means that your 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 RMS is going up and a, and a peak is staying the same or going up. So crest factor will be will be decreasing. So it's very it's very useful as well. For the moment, I will remove it because uh, we still don't have any data, so it cannot be relative to anything. So I will remove it. And by this, I configured my alarm with the name cavitation peak and. It has a value, absolute mode and safe mode. Later on, down the road, I will, I will, I will use also relative mode. And I will save it. So you can see in my alarm bank, right now I have one single alarm. Okay, that's, that's a good beginning still. I can put another one. I can put this one on, uh, on, on vibration, on, on uh, accelerometer. 64 uh, sampling, kilo samples per second. Mm, let's say 10 Hertz to 1 kilohertz. Um, alarm name uh, will be, I don't know, WIB1. Just keep the name that will associate you. I'm just using number one just, just like that. It will associate you what is this alarm for. Or you can say it, let's put it this way. Uh, sorry. Uh, motor non-drive end. And I want you to monitor uh, peak acceleration. And then I can say, okay, absolute mode on. If it's two, if it's three, or if it's four. Absolute mode, alert, warning, and danger. I can also put the safe mode. I can say, really, if my, if my, if my, uh, my peak acceleration is zero five, that might be that machine is not working at all or uh, my upper limit if it's uh, let's say 25 that's probably the wrong measurement you can also use the relative mode as well now we don't have any data so i will not use it but put it in the bank uh, of course this one will be monitoring peak acceleration so i gave him the gave him the name vib motor non-drive end it's considering accelerometer uh, 10 Hertz to 1 kilohertz and it's monitoring peak acceleration if I do the same thing uh, with the same parameters 10 Hertz to 1 kilohertz I give him I give him a uh, VIB uh, motor non-drive end and I said I wanted to monitor RMS acceleration and just I'll just uh, now put any numbers uh, really any numbers and I will say save alarm name not not entered I will call it RMS fine so uh, now I have this one monitoring RMS acceleration this one monitoring peak acceleration and I can attach them because those are two different alarms I can attach them to the same point so if you count a little bit you can see here that I can monitor four different four different indicators on each point and each indicator will be monitoring three absolute values two safe values and four relative values multiply that but by four indicators and you will see that it's big number of eyes monitoring each point you just have to set them properly i'm talking about numbers so look at the data understand what is good and what is bad see how consistent your data is the more consistent the data is the more sensitive alarm you can put and this is the way you put alarm
Yes, I want to add, exit. So I have certain al alarms in my alarm bank. So let's close it now. Fine. What I can do now is I can go to my pump, volute, and I can add set alarm from template on this measurement RS2T Focus 256. And you remember we choose the alarm which is for volute because we are probably looking for, for, for cavitation. So uh, we have only three, only six points here, so I, I just wanted to make it simple for you. I can say set alarm from template. So what you can see here, uh, considering that I was clicking on RS2T Focus 256, my alarm system is immediately offering me only uh, alarms that I have set on this sensor and this sampling rate. If I go here and if I go here, I have no more to choose. I have just one. If there are more different alarms that are considering this sensor and this sampling rate, I will be able to choose more. So I will just be just be going through and browsing through all the alarms here left and right. Choose the right one. Now I have just one. And I will say, OK, attach it. So now it's attached to this point. How can I see that? So click on this point. Here you are in tab readings. Obviously we have no readings. We know that also because there is this folder icon. But if I click on alarms, here it is. So now I know that there is an alarm set on this point and on two criteria. It's the name of the alarm is cavitation peak, alert 50, warning 56, danger 62. But there is also a safe range between 10 and 100. So if it's lower than 10 and if it's higher than 100, it will, it will trigger the alarm. So the safe range is, let's say, defined between 10 and 100. Of course, when you have some data, you will, you will, you will, you will define some reasonable, reasonable uh, safe range. So this is how you will see this alarm. You can, you can go point by point and add alarms. But if I have six pumps here, and more or less, if, of course, big if, they are operating in the same range, they are in a similar condition uh, with the certain tolerance, of course, because don't forget the baseline or the good line is never a line, it's an area. So don't expect your six machines to work in absolutely identical way and give you identical numbers. That will not happen. You will not have identical uh, values of readings after one month, after two months. They will always fluctuate a little bit. So that's how I will create alarm based on real data. So for the moment, I will remove this alarm. So I showed you how you can set alarms point by point, like a pedestrian, slowly. So I will detach this alarm. And if I click here, you see, alarm is gone. It's not gone from the template alarm functions my cavitation is here so my setting from this alarm is still in the bank i will use it when i need it the fact that i detached it doesn't remove it from the bank it's still there but uh, i also want to show you how to add them as a group so i can click on my water recirculation i can make a selection filter and i can tell him here i will write it again because i want you to write it again uh, as well so volute, as you can see, I have six pumps, three, three leads and three backups, and I have six volutes, of course, and I would like to monitor those volutes on a regular basis and have alarm on them. So I will select first one, shift, last one, select them all, and I will say alarms. Now, in alarms menu, in, in, a, in a bottom toolbar, it says, show me the points in alarm, attach with existing so that means show me existing alarms and i will attach one of them because i already have one in the bank for me attach with new so that means i don't have alarm for this point but i will i will create it right now or you want to get detach all alarms if you have them already in this our case i will attach with existing so attach with existing and it's telling me yes you have this one available for this sensor and i will just click attach so with this, what we did right now, if you click on any volute, you will see 
please do the same that I do and you click on alarms the alarm is attached on all of them so it makes it quite easy when you have group of assets that behave more or less in the same range and you create one alarm and you put on all of them now let me also show you that you can go this way so I will click water recirculation so show me everything by the way this number here shows you how many leaves at the end of the tree how many measurement settings you have in this selected area so in this area water recirculation I have 198 of them in pump 1 I have 33 so I want to I want to see them all I will again click selection filter I will choose my volute I will select all of them click on alarms and I will say attach with new so I have a great idea for alarm I, I now also want to monitor crest factor on this on these pumps because I have some data and I have some ideas so as you can see these two things are automatically defined it's RS2T focus 256 kilo samples per second because they are all that you cannot you cannot you cannot put uh, uh, focus or, or, or 32 kilo samples on this one so I can call it cavitation crest factor and I want you to monitor crest factor absolute value of crest factor if it's uh, more than 7 give me alert if it's more than 10 give me warning if it's more than 13 show me danger now of course the safe mode I can also say if crest factor is less than 3 that's that's not going to be realistic honestly because if crest factor is less than 3 I have a, a, I have a reason to suspect that uh, the signal is clipped so it's it's a good idea to have this to have this uh, to have this alarm on crest factor because if you have crest factor 2 there is a high probability that, that the signal is clipped and the upper limit I can just invent it now and say 60 everything in between is let's say okay measurement everything is healthy you can also use relative mode as I explained you before so in this process we choose the assets you choose the measurement points and settings and we say yes I want to attach a, a group alarm on all of them but I want to create a new one so this is exactly what we did we created the new one we will save it and it's attached so let's check one of the volumes and you see we have two alarms attached on volume the first one is cavitation crest factor as we say 7 10 13 and the safe range is between 3 and 60 and the cavitation peak with the same numbers we had before so the group alarm is now attached and we are all nice and happy so let's let's put some some alarm on uh, on a vibration so because there is a possibility to make a small mistake and i just want to help you with that so you can see uh, acceleration 10 hertz to 1 kilohertz 64 so let's see what we have in the bank so set alarm from template yes we have one for that so we can assign it with no problem i will assign alarm and here it is so that's my alarm i can assign much more alarms in the same way you just assign this one but not two alarms on the same on the same indicator so you cannot have two alarms monitoring peak on the same machine because those are then conflicting data you can have one monitoring peak another one monitoring uh, crest factor rms velocity rms acceleration <clears throat> of course if i click here and want to add alarm set alarm from template i don't have any see there are no alarms defined for the selected measurement because this measurement is 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz and if you remember i go to my alarms there's nothing i set for the range 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz so your alarm bark is saying sorry i don't have one i, I would like to offer it to you but you don't have one so you should go there and set it and create that alarms 
So this is how you work with a, with a template alarm. So you can attach them individually. You can attach them as a group when you select from uh, when you select from the from the bottom pen and you add them as a group. You can detach them individually or as a group. So again, the same way I attached it, I will select items and detach it completely. But there is another another way to, to, to work with alarms and it's very important for you to know it. So let's go back to Volute because on Volute we already have two alarms. So we have two template alarms. One is monitoring crest factor, another one is monitoring peak. Now for this particular pump, and this is the situation when I will use my node alarm. For this particular pump, I realized, and I already have sufficient data to come to that conclusion, I will set node alarm. So this is individual alarm. It's not in your alarm bank. It concerns only this point. So I will say, I want you to monitor RMS for me. And absolute mode will be, let's say 25, 31 and 37. I have certain data, I have certain data consistency, I came to certain conclusions and I can say that this pump is beautifully working at 19 or 20 dB microvolt, whatever. I'm just inventing number here. Uh, and I want my alarm to be from 25, 31, 37 because I have sufficient data for other pumps they are not really so stable, they are going up and down and so there can be many reasons why you want to put this alarm individually. And then it will be, you, you can attach it to node. And if you take a look, I have another one, but this one is marked with a small bell. So that one is node alarm, it's not in your list. These two, they are. So this one is local alarm and this one is picked from your alarm bank. And it's very important because probably you will be playing with alarms a lot. So do it properly because they will help you greatly to do your job nicely. Now, I, you can also detach that alarm, of course, as you can see here, detach alarm individually. Here in this menu, right click on, on a measurement point, you can detach all alarms. But if you only want to detach one alarm, you can detach the, that alarm individually. So use that option. You don't want to you don't want to remove all alarms if just one of them is problematic. So I have this node alarm. I can go here and I can again do set node alarm. He's opening me to one I have already, and there is a mark here. Alarm is attached. So yes, I have it here. I attached it already. I can choose another one. But what happens if I have a situation that all my other pumps, now I have enough data, consistent data, they are stabilized. And this alarm that I actually chose on pump number one is now it. It's the alarm for all the pumps. And I want to use it on all of them. Now you don't need to copy paste. You don't need to do it again individually on all pumps. What you can do is copy it to alarm list. Now it's opening your alarm bank and saying, okay, you want to use this, uh, you want to copy this alarm into the template list. Yes, I want to do it because I want to do it on multiple points. Nice. So first of all, it's blinking, give it a name. So I can say, I can call it uh, Volute RMS. Okay, you gave it the name, save it. And now you can see this alarm is also in bank. I'm trying to explain you this uh, in this way because at the beginning of your condition monitoring program and using UAS free, uh, you don't have enough data, enough consistent data, and you are not working with assets still enough to have all the assets certainly stabilized to a certain level and having more or less consistent data. And you cannot understand the asset based on one measurement. So at the beginning, you will probably start with, with, with node alarms individually. So you look at the asset individually, but then after certain activities, interventions, maybe some alignment, balancing, changing some bearings, whatever, whatever you will do, 
you, you can say, okay, now my free pumps are quite stabilized and they are more or less in the same range. Never equal, but in the same range. So let's put, let's put some template alarm. In that case, you can choose alarm from the node alarm, save it as a template and use it, use it for all of them. So what I will do right now is I will close this and you can see that on this pump, I have, I have it as a node alarm. I cannot attach another one on the same on the same indicator. So I will try just to show you how it does why it doesn't work. So I will say set alarm from template, and here I have a cavitation peak, cavitation crest factor, volute RMS. So you can see now I have more alarms, so I can browse through alarms and choose one. So this one is monitoring RMS, and I will say attach. As you see, it's telling me, sorry, you already have alarm monitor watching the, the RMS, so you cannot use another one. It doesn't matter if it's same, but it's just conflicting. So it's saying, no, you cannot do this one. Okay, I will not do that. I will remove this one. I will remove node alarm. So you can see it's gone. I will now choose all my volutes. So water recirculation, selection, filter, readings. I will put the keyword volute, select them all with clicking first, shift, clicking last, alarm, attach with existing, which one you want, peak we already have, crest factor we already have, wow, that's the new one, attach. Oh, I already put it somewhere, sorry, <laughs> I had to remove it. See, so I have to remove it. Crest factor peak. Uh, now we have to remember where did I put it. So I obviously put it somewhere. Okay, I will have to check that later. But anyway, we will not be adding it now because we don't have any data anyway. So now we add some alarms and uh, not on all of the all of the points uh, because we don't have any data so the alarms we put now it's just uh, just releasing some balloons just i'm just inventing the numbers so don't do that uh, the point is to show you how to set alarms not what values are good or bad your data will tell you what value is good or bad and that's 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 what counts uh, also i want to show you how you will uh, set how you will set the events. Events are quite quite important in condition monitoring because it's an information. It's sometimes critical information to understand the behavior of the asset. So we can say on the on this uh, on this motor we can add new event. So we can say on 19 of April 2021 we can say that motor repaired bearings replaced save so right now when i click on the motor i click on the events here it is i know that that day we did something with this motor at the very beginning it doesn't make much sense i understand but you can just imagine that if you have if you have a certain trend, certain amount of data monitoring this this point, and then uh, one day the numbers are completely different, and you have no idea why, because nobody told you that while you were at the vacation, we replaced the bearing of that motor, we aligned everything, we balanced the fan, and now it's a completely different situation. And of course, your numbers are completely different and your alarms are not really accurate anymore. They don't work anymore for, for this new condition. So it's, it's really important to document everything. The condition monitoring is not only the data that you see in the graph. It's everything around it. And we are trying to help you to put the, 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 uh, as much as possible inside, inside US3. So this is quite important because later on, when we have some when we have some interesting data here there will be a point in your static trend saying oops on this day the motor was repaired and the bearings were replaced 
and and that point in your in your graph will actually clearly explain you that uh, uh, there is a reason why your signal changed and of course if if you are if you are monitoring this this repair it's a great place to say okay i can confirm that on this day with this message on the screen uh, after that the signal is beautiful clear and nice and the repair was successful and good so put all these comments put all these events because they will be uh, they will be quite useful in understanding the asset behavior also as i told you before what you want to see in your graph now we come to the point that you want to see all the measurement since this event so you can say okay don't delete anything but just don't show me every time what happened before we replaced uh, bearings show me just after that so it's again a certain point in time that you can refer to so uh, as much as you can put put this data in because events will really really help you a lot so there will be a collection of events here explaining what happened why and when it's like a nice reminder a nice collection of data so now we built our tree structure we built our our work orders we set certain alarms as you can see some of our points have alarms some don't of course and there is another thing i want to show you because uh, later on we will be playing it with it a lot once we have the data but for the moment it's important for you to see that when you click the work orders survey tab so here are your work orders you will have a work order survey tab in your in your top toolbar click on it go down and there is a to-do list so to-do list is exactly as we were saying to-do list so this is your task planner so you can choose what i what do i need to do current week next week current month next month show me only my missed measurements and show me never measured points just want to expand it a little bit on this and explain you so uh, the at the moment you take the first measurement the clock starts ticking so if you set the interval on 30 days uh, software will not tell you you have to go to measure it after 30 days because you haven't started yet the clock is still not ticking with the first measurement it will start ticking so if you can as you can see now if i click what do i need to do next month uh nothing well that's actually good news but it's not realistic uh why nothing because you still haven't got, got any measurement and interval 30 days cannot be calculated based on anything so once you have the first measurement then you will be reminded that in 30 days that in 30 days you have to do this and that this is a very good way to plan your work because you can come on Monday in, in, uh, at your desk and you can say, okay, what do I need to do this week? And then it will take everything uh, which falls in this week to be done. And in that case, some of our users, me very often, I, I, I don't have, uh, I don't use the, 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 the same typical work orders that, that reoccur because I don't know what will be the next month. Maybe one of the guys will be at the vacation, another one will be sick, so we will have to reorganize a little bit. What I do is I come on Monday at work, I click, okay, what do I need to do this week? And then there will be the whole list of things that needs to be, need, need to be done this week. And then I can say, okay, this guy is at a vacation, this guy is sick, I have two guys, okay, let's reorganize it a little bit. And then I can reorganize it from here. So here I will select and add to new work order. The same goes with your missed measurements. Right now, we don't have any missed measurements because we are not late with anything. We are, we are in time. There is still no first measurement when the clock starts ticking. But this is a very useful feature for, to organize your work because uh, sometimes you will be late with measurements. If you are late one or two or three days, nothing, nothing catastrophic will happen. But if you start forgetting, that's not a good, good idea really. But what you can do when you come to work in the morning, you can, you can select missed measurements. And here it will be certain number of measurements that are overdue. So the 30 days, the interval that you set, or 45 days or six months, doesn't matter, is, is overdue. So you need to do it. 
So, by logic of the work, what is your first task? Your first task is to do the things that you are late with. So, you can select them here and add them to new work order, which will be called probably urgent. So, I will select all the mismeasurements and I will put them in the new work order. The name will be do it urgently. And then somebody or me or you or somebody else will go and do that urgently. You have also another, another thing which is called never measured points. So the software will extract everything you have in your work orders which has no measurement at all. So in, in later stages of your condition monitoring program that will be for instance newly installed machines. So it will just remind you, okay, we have some time now, uh, we, we, we don't have any urgent job today, let's do the new machines and take the, and take the initial measurement. So you can click here, never measure points. In our case, it's going to be quite a long list. You can see, because we have no measurements in our tree structure now at all, so the to-do list is telling you, well, my friend, you have a lot of never measure points. So I can choose some of them. I can say I will do this, this, this. I'm pressing control button. So control and select. Uh, okay, I will do this and this and this. Right click, 340, add it to new survey, and I can call it urgent. This is, this is exactly what I would be doing. Uh, this is exactly what I will be doing with my, uh, with my missed measurements. And here it is, urgent. So obviously I need to do this today. This is a very efficient way to organize your work, to be sure you will not be forgetting things, uh, because it's normal to skip sometimes, it happens, people are not always available, but then you can remind yourself to do it. So we organized our work orders, we, we filtered the data from the bottom pen, we used certain tools from the bottom pen, uh, we built our three structures for six assets. We did, we did some interesting job. We set up some alarms and now we will, we will uh, transfer it to device with all new data because we, are, we add some alarms, we add some new work orders. So let's transfer it now and in the next chapter we will start, we will collect some data and then get back and see what we can do with, with data. How do we analyze the data? How we follow the trend? What do we do with alarms? And it's going to be quite interesting. So it's transferred to my instrument and the next thing is to go and collect some data. See you in the next chapter. Take care.